Hello, uh, my name is April Rovero, and I am the Executive Director of the National Coalition Against Prescription Drug Abuse. We want to wel welcome you to our educational interview series. Today we're going to be interviewing Mark Karen Dang, who is with the Haida organization, and he's an old friend. Uh, not old in terms of age, but uh, definitely in terms of connection. He's a great supporter of our coalition and also the Contra Costa County Meds Coalition. So welcome, Mark, uh, to our interview today. And we are going to um, have our youth ambassadors conducting our interview today. And so Amina is our lead on this particular interview. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Amina and we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so to start off, could you tell us what HIDTA is and what your role is in preventing access and use of illegal drugs? Uh, sure thing, Amina. So um, HIDTA stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. And um, you know, looking at it from a three layer perspective will probably help out. Um, at the very top layer of our organization is the executive office of the president of the United States. Um, and so President Biden has several offices that help him carry his legislative agenda forward. Um, and one of these offices is, is in charge with leading, coordinating and developing uh, US drug policy. Uh, this is done through the office of the National Drug Control Policy, uh, which is the second layer of our organization. Um, you know, the last and final layer of our organization is the, the HIDA program. And uh, really what HIDA is, is a way for, uh, for law enforcement to investigate, uh, disrupt, and dismantle major drug trafficking organizations. Uh, nationally, we have 33 uh, congressionally approved HIDA regions. And California is very unique in that we have uh, four HIDA regions. And really, this just highlights how big of a scope of a problem in the state of California is uh, when it comes to drug producing and uh, drug trafficking. Uh, my role as the drug intelligence officer is to uh, you know, facilitate law enforcement's efforts in getting drugs um, off of our streets and out of our communities uh, with a secondary role of, of helping community-based organizations, uh, such as this organization, in uh, strengthening the uh, reduction in demand for, uh, for drugs. And uh, you know, we really do that by, by sharing uh, intelligence and information and being a you know, very, very active law enforcement participa uh, participant uh, in addressing our community drug problems. Moving on, we would like to ask you to describe the depth of our nation's substance use disorder and overdose epidemic. Um, so if I had one word to, to best describe the depth of our nation's substance use disorder, um, that one word would, would probably be dire. Um, our national drug control problem is, is dire. Um, I believe it to be the greatest threat to, uh, to public health and safety. Um, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, I sit in a lot of meetings, um, and attend a lot of conferences, uh, with uh, talks about you know threats to to public health and and public safety, and you know in a lot of these meetings we talk about you know domestic terrorism, we talk about white nationalism, uh, international terrorism such as Al Qaeda, and um, COVID. COVID has also been a huge talking point, you know, especially during the last year. But with all those combined, uh, they're not going to come near close to, to um, you know, really addressing the greatest threat to public health, uh, which is addiction. Um, no other social issue has, has, has killed more Americans than all of our modern wars uh, combined. Uh, no other social issues you know, really impacts every community from Main Street to, to our, our inner city streets to, to rural America with so much um, impunity. Um, and no other social issue has impacted more generations of Americans and their families than, than addiction. Um, and to sum it all up, um, again, uh, it would be dire. Our addiction situation in our country um, is dire, especially with the amount of overdoses we are experiencing. Thank you. And we understand that a lot of these overdoses um, happen because of a substance called fentanyl. 
So we'd like to ask you um, to tell us how, what fentanyl is exactly and how the fentanyl supply chain works. So uh, fentanyl uh, is uh, the single contributing factor to uh, the most recent um, spate of, of opioid related overdoses. And, you know, to understand the problem, you know, one really needs to know what, what fentanyl is. Um, you know, fentanyl is a very, very strong analgesiac opioid, uh, which was made available since the late 60s, I believe. And, you know, fentanyl does have a medical uh, therapeutic purpose. It's a very, very strong pain reliever, uh, really reserved for those suffering from um, great amounts of pain, such as those recovering from surgery or those suffering from long-term terminal uh, cancer, for example. And so, um, you know, fentanyl is, is highly addictive. Um, and, you know, fentanyl is made in, um, in laboratories. Anybody with very, very basic chemical know-how and someone who has access to some of the precursor chemicals required to manufacture fentanyl um, can make fentanyl. And so from a, you know, drug trafficking organization perspective, uh, it really is the, the perfect way to, you know, to profit off of addiction. Um, you know, fentanyl is, is very heavily regulated and controlled within the medical uh, community. Uh, the fentanyl that we're seeing on the news today is uh, illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And uh, the, these fentanyls are manufactured and produced um, in somebody's basement, some, you know, in, 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 in somebody's uh, drug stash house. Very, very little regulation um, and oversight. Um, and that is why fentanyl is, is, is everywhere, easily accessible and attainable. And following up on that, um, so what forms does fentanyl come in? Um, predominantly, we're seeing fentanyl in, in both powdered and um, pill form. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's a chemical component uh, which can be uh, used to, uh, to mix uh, and other types of drugs like uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, um, heroin, marijuana. We're seeing people, you know, smoke fentanyl, uh, inject fentanyl, um, and uh, inhale fentanyl. So it's it's uh, pretty diverse in terms of its makeup. And just to kind of um, like get across really how powerful this substance is, um, can you explain kind of how potent it is compared to other drugs such as morphine? Sure. So, so fentanyl is is fifty to a hundred more times stronger than uh, than morphine, um, and so with a drug with that level of, of potency, uh, we can certainly see why it's it's highly addictive um, and deadly uh, at the same time. So, moving on, we want to ask you what role does fentanyl play in our current overdose epidemic. What role does fentanyl play in our current overdose epidemic? Um, fentanyl is, is essentially feeding our, our drug appetite problem. Um, there is such a huge appetite for, uh, for fentanyl and uh, you know, major drug trafficking organizations are more than happy to, to uh, supply that, that appetite. And so, as previously mentioned, uh, you know, fentanyl is, is, is everywhere, easily accessible and easily attainable. Um, so following up on that question, um, what advice do you have for people who might be tempted to buy any drug through a social media site such as TikTok or even an online pharmacy? Um, well, you know, obviously the the messaging from the 80s, just say no to drugs, you know, has proven not to be as uh, effective as we want. Um, you know, uh, some good sound advice outside of, you know, trying to, to stay away from, from any type of drugs uh, would be to, you know, um, be as safe and precautious as much as possible. Um, I'm by no way means of encouraging people to experiment uh, in drugs. Um, However, you know, if you do go down that path, be safe and, and responsible. Um, you know, have other people with you so somebody can call 911. Have Narcan readily available. Um, and, you know, just, just 
try to limit exposure from these toxic chemicals um, as much as possible. So our next question is, how do you believe that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted both the supply and the demand of illegal opioids and other drugs? Um, actually, I was very surprised with um, the correlation between uh, the last year and a half with COVID and what's happening with our overdoses. Um, initially, I believed our overdoses were going to uh, decrease. Um, and the reason why is, 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 is because of constraints to the uh, supply um, of these illicit narcotics. And so when everything shut down worldwide, um, we knew that was going to have a detrimental effect to the drug supply <laughs> into uh, the country. Um, we shut down our borders. Um, I think, uh, you know, the flow of traffic from Mexico was, was, was really um, hindered. Uh, and so, you know, with a negative impact to the supply of drugs, one would, you know, assume that the overdoses would, would in turn decrease. Uh, actually, the opposite has happened. Um, and so during this COVID epidemic, we've seen uh, an increased amount of, of drug-related overdoses, uh, which we, we have not seen before in terms of, of magnitude. And so, you know, this leads us to a very difficult conclusion that um, the supply market is heavily protected from outside disturbances, such as a global pandemic. Um, drug trafficking organizations uh, to the South no longer require help and assistance from, uh, from global markets, meaning they're able to produce their own uh, precursor chemicals required to manufacture fentanyl, for example. Um, and lastly, you know, our you know, public health responses um, have been inadequate in dealing with the drug epidemic uh, because they had to shift their attention and focus to, to COVID. And so, you know, this level of support really displaced um, a lot of people. And when you have a lot of people already addicted to, uh, to drugs um, and also having drugs readily available and ac accessible, you know, this really resulted in an unprecedented amount of overdose cases um, in our communities, uh, not just in our state, but, but nationwide as well. Um, so you've mentioned how easily accessible these drugs are and how they show up in other substances as well. Uh, so based off of that, what advice do you have for youth who are looking to turn towards the use of fentanyl or any other sort of illegal opioid or prescription drug? Well, uh, first and foremost, stay away, um, definitely. Um, you know, understand, uh, you know, the harmful effects of, of experimenting with drugs. Um, you know, that's first and foremost. Uh, but again, uh, like I mentioned previously, um, if you do find yourself in an environment where, you know, you wanna experiment or if your friends are experimenting, um, you know, call 911 for, you know, emergency medical, should an emergency medical situation arise, such as an overdose, um, you know, uh, get access to Narcan, know what Narcan is, how to use it, know how to do CPR, you know, understand some of the symptoms of overdoses so you could render uh, aid. Uh, one thing about overdoses is, you know, for the most part, overdoses are, uh, overdose fatalities, um, it's preventable. Um, and, and, and so getting somebody to, to treatment as soon as overdose events occurs uh, can potentially save, save a life. So along with the question that we just asked, what general advice do you have for parents of the, of the youth uh, regarding the opioid epidemic, such as locking certain medicines in a certain cabinet, looking for signs of substance use and anything similar to that? Yeah, um, I have three points for parents. Um, so, so the first point, you know, parents really need to be, um, they need to understand the threats uh, that, that may be, that, that that may pose harmful to their kids. You know, understand the threats of, of opioids, um, drugs, you know, understand what is happening out in the communities um, as well as nationally. And so, you know, we hear about um, the fentanyl epidemic in the news, uh, but, but, but really understand what is driving uh, that threat. Um, 
the second thing I would offer to parents is, you know, be very, very well versed in some of the applications that their kids are using. Um, you know, understand how TikTok works, understand how Facebook, Instagram, um, and Snapchat works. Um, I know that can be very, very difficult because, uh, you know, I, 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 I could only imagine my mom, you know, trying to unlock my phone and trying to figure out the same apps that I use. And I chuckle at that, at that notion. Um, and that's probably gonna be the hardest thing is, is for parents to get well-versed in some of the applications and the technology uh, youth are using today. Um, you know, the third you know, tip I would offer to parents, I'm a parent myself, is to um, you know, be an active influence in their child's lives. Um, you know, when kids have a void to fill, uh, they'll fill it with, with, you know, entertaining themselves through, you know, through the use of social media, um, for example. Um, unfortunately, you know, social media has a lot of influence on, on how kids perceive the world. And this could be both, you know, uh, a negative um, and a positive. And as much as possible, you know, be active influences in uh, your child's lives. Um, you know, hopefully it'll prevent them from going down a path of, of addiction. So do you have anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, probably just, just one last thing. Uh, you know, you all, you know, the three of you are, are the future, essentially, and you are all in control of your own destiny. Um, you know, don't let a drug or the, uh, you know, the itch of experimentation uh, you know, rob you of your future and control you of your destiny. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you all. Anything else? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so thank you, Mark. Um, I always appreciate uh, your insight and your knowledge and your background is uh, just perfect for the work you do. I wanted to just comment, you know, over this past year and a few months, we've all been affected by the COVID situation. And we are really concerned about the mental health impact of the epidemic or pandemic on not just youth, but everybody. And so often people will move over to substances to try to cope with, you know, mental health challenges, anxiety or, or whatever. Um, we've been offering mental health first aid to our coalition members and our youth are going to be able to take advantage of that soon here too. And I just wanted to throw out there that I think it's super important for parents to be tuned in to their kids' mental health. You know, they've got their own personal challenges, but to really tune in, especially during this time frame when things are just not normal, kids are being, um, you know, excluded from even classroom settings and the social you know, opportunities that school itself offers and on and on. So I just wanted to throw that in. I'm, I'm sure you support that thought too. Um, additionally, Narcan, having Narcan on hand, I think every parent should have it in their home just in case. And I just wanted to make sure um, parents know how to get Narcan. First of all, or our organization, for those who live in California, we can provide it, but even easier, Naloxoneforall.org is a website where anybody can go on and just take a quick little test, little training thing, and then uh, they provide just basic information. And two Narcan cartridges will be mailed to the address provided. So that would be an add-on to what you've shared. You've clearly stated we need Narcan. And I even understand with fentanyl, it can take more than two uh, doses of Narcan to overturn an overdose. So it's really important to have it and know everybody should call 911 as soon as they recognize an overdose might be, you know, in progress. So any yeah, other no, thoughts connected to that? Yeah, um, one other thing, you know, we already mentioned about the importance of calling 911. Um, you know, another key takeaway to, to, to having Narcan available is, is understand that in the state of California, uh, we have good Samaritan laws um, mm -hmm. in place. So if you're with somebody who's overdosing because you know, you know, people are, are experimenting with drugs, if you call 911 to help save the lives, uh, you know, we have laws in place where you will not get in trouble. 
Um, real briefly, I'll share with you a very tragic story out of Arizona. Um, you know, a group of friends uh, were experimenting with, um, with fentanyl and one of the friends uh, overdosed uh, from in in ingesting um, counterfeit prescription medication, uh, which unbeknownst to him had fentanyl in there. Um, my friends didn't know what to do. They were scared to call uh, 911. Um, in Arizona, just like California, has a good uh, Samaritan law. Um, had they called 911 uh, sooner rather than later, uh, there's a high possibility that that friend uh, would be alive today. Uh, and so, you know, calling 911 will not get you in trouble. Um, you know, get help as soon as possible if you're witnessing somebody overdosing. Yeah, do you want to just throw out um, a couple of the most obvious overdose signs that you'd want to share just so parents or young people watching this video would know kind of what to look for for an opioid related overdose? They, um, people die from overdoses uh, because their body stops breathing. Um, you know, when dealing with fentanyl and, you know, various other types of drugs, um, the brain literally forgets to, to, to remind itself to, uh, to breathe. And so what Narcan does is Narcan gets rid of the drug, which makes us forget how to breathe. And so signs of symptoms of somebody, somebody overdosing is, is, is number one, loss of consciousness, uh, not breathing, uh, you know, turning blue, uh, not being responsive. Um, and, you know, Actions such as Narcan administration, calling 911, uh, CPR, we've, we've all learned CPR in health classes, you know, will really help, uh, um, you know, keep death away as far as possible for that very few precious moments that you have. Yeah, and every minute counts when it comes to you know, somebody not breathing and potential brain damage there. So you may survive an overdose and have some major problems after. So time is really, really important. Okay, well, is there anything else, Mark, you can think of? <laughs> any of our youth ambassadors have any other questions or thoughts you wanna add to the mix here? Um, just, uh, I saw a note of, uh, about social media and social media's role in our drug epidemic. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to make a point that, you know, social media um, can essentially play two roles, right? And so, there's both good and bad with with social media and and advertisement. Um, you know, the bad part about it is, you know, with social media, um, it may attract a certain you know viewpoint towards towards drugs, um, as well as make drugs more easily accessible. Uh, there's a huge concern within the law enforcement community where apps such as Snapchat um, and uh, TikTok and Instagram are a venue for folks to be able to seek out drugs. Uh, drug dealers are advertising some of their, uh, you know, supply on social media, which, make, which makes it super easy for somebody to, to get access to, um, to drugs. On a positive side, you know, social media uh, can be used to, you know, to, to educate folks about the dangers of drugs, educate uh, parents, um, and really serve as a, you know, public service announcement in the dangers of what's happening in the communities. Well, and that's a really good segue to our next, uh, uh, we want to provide a little slide here, because uh, NCAPDA is up on pretty much all the social media um, sites now, including TikTok. We actually have a TikTok team that has been formed, and Amina and another uh, member of our Youth Ambassador Program are leading but it's really to use that platform to counterbalance or counteract those negative influences that we see on that particular technology. So anyway, um, yeah, great segue. These are this, the, the sites we're up on. Um, those who are watching this video, uh, no doubt found us through YouTube. And that's where we have a lot of the educational and lived experience interviews that we've um, put together over the last several months posted. So we really encourage people to, to go on there, learn from them, send your friends and family to them also. And then of course we have our websites and, and all that. So if anyone has any questions that's watching the video and wants to connect with us, here's our contact information. And then if we can move to the next slide, uh, this is a really good reference also, the overdose response strategy at the national level. You reference the 
uh, certainly HIDA, but also the Office of National Drug Control Policy. So this comes from the top levels of our government, and it's um, a great um, way to learn about what we're doing collectively around the country to manage this issue too. So once again, thank you so much, Mark. It's great to have you with us today, and I know this will make a difference in someone's life, and that's the purpose of it. So thank, thank you very much for being with us, and thank, thank you to you. our youth ambassadors who are so dedicated and have done a lot of work behind the scenes to put this together today. Thank you, too. All right, well, we will um, call this a wrap, so thank you very much.